into a space where beauty meets authenticity and transformation is not just a possibility, but a promise. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you to someone truly special, Dr. Rukmini Vinaya Rednam, the compassionate force behind the countless remarkable transformations in the vibrant city of Houston, Texas. Picture this, every curve, every contour crafted with care and expertise not just by a board certified plastic surgeon but your very own cheerleader for self-discovery and confidence get ready to embark on a journey where we explore the art of science of feeling your very best self this isn't just a podcast it's your cozy corner of empowerment and inspiration so pull up a chair pour yourself a cup of kindness and let's dive into the confidence doc podcast with Dr. Rukmini Vinaya Rednam. Welcome to the Confidence Doc Podcast. I'm Dr. Rednam. I am a board certified plastic surgeon in Houston, Texas with my Houston surgeons. Today we have a special guest. This is Dr. Victoria Chang. She is a bariatric and general surgeon here in Houston, Texas, and I've had the privilege of knowing her now for many years. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's such a privilege. So Dr. Chang, tell us a little bit about how you got into bariatric surgery. Yeah, so I was, I actually discovered it as a medical student. Um, I knew I wanted to, you know, I went to medical school as probably most surgeons did, knowing I wanted to do something surgical. And I had reached out to my mentor saying, can you hook me up with somebody who does surgical research? And that person happened to be a bariatric surgeon. And that's how I found out about bariatric surgery. And when I saw the kind of work that he was doing and that this was a life-changing, life-altering surgery, um, it just, I fell in love with it. It's such a high-yield surgery. It addresses so many different problems, um, literally, literally transforms people's lives, and there's just no other surgery like it. It is absolutely life-changing. Mm-hmm. I guess, um, how do you become a bariatric surgeon? Because I think that some people don't fully understand the amount of training that goes into it. Yeah, so uh, for bariatrics, you have to go through five years of general surgery training. Uh, well, four years of medical school, then five years of general surgery training, and then it's one year of a minimally invasive surgery slash bariatrics fellowship. Um, are all people who call themselves bariatric surgeons, do they all go through this training or are there people that do bariatric surgery without that training? Yeah, so there's both. So bariatrics fellowship was a is a relatively new fellowship. Uh, when people started doing bariatric surgery back in the 60s, um, it really, really, really was general surgeons doing bariatric surgery, doing weight loss surgery. Um, and then eventually the fellowship came out. So a lot of those surgeons who are kind of grandfathered into bariatrics are still out there practicing. And, they, you know, they just they continue practicing. Do They do good work through experience, you know, mm-hmm. just because they've just done so many for so many years. Um, and but nowadays of a probably in a younger generation, maybe my age, it's really difficult to come out and call yourself a bariatric surgeon unless you've done a fellowship. Um, so you either if you're going to be a bariatric surgeon, you either earned it through years of operating and experience um, or by doing a fellowship. I think that that's the case with a lot of things now. I think um, especially in surgical specialties, we are getting more and more narrow in our scope um, and then people are becoming like super specialists in one area. So I think that that's a good thing because we're really getting to focus on all around care. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I was going to say that's definitely the case because, uh, uh, like I said, nowadays, it's really hard for a younger surgeon to come out without the training and say, I'm a bariatric surgeon, just because there are so many fellowship programs now who that when you focus on doing bariatrics, because it's not just a surgery, it's the perioperative care, because mm-hmm. the bariatric patient is uh, struggling with a lot of different things in life, you know, and from a psychiatric standpoint to a lifestyle standpoint. And so these are all the facets of bariatric surgery that we kind of learn about in fellowship training that you don't really get in just regular general surgery training. If someone, let's, let's say, listening to us today is somebody who's like, how do I know if this might be something right for me? Like, how does that process even start? If you think maybe maybe I am somebody that might need bariatric surgery? Well, that's a great question. I feel like a lot of my patients who start thinking about weight loss surgery Obviously, I've been thinking about weight and weight loss for a long time, Um, but most of them have known someone who got weight loss surgery, Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what piques their interest. A lot of people don't really know uh, whether or not 
they're good candidates though. I feel like right. a lot of people think about weight loss surgery, but don't understand who, who makes a good candidate for weight mm -hmm. loss surgery. Um, so I got to ask you, obviously now with all these medications flooding the market, right? right? Uh, different weight loss medications from a uh, semaglutide, trisepatide, mm -hmm. um, that's just naming a couple. Um, how has this affected your specialty? Yeah, that's a great question. The GLP-1 agonists are such a hot topic right now. Um, not only as a society, but definitely in the bariatric surgery world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, like I think that there are less people, you know, seeking out surgery nowadays, which I understand, which I, I understand, you know, there's this great drug, the GLP-1 agonists are a great uh, treatment option for weight. Uh, and so a lot of people are seeking out that option first now before they go down the surgery route, which I think is totally reasonable. Uh, because there are good candidates, like candidates who had previously qualified for weight loss surgery, mm -hmm. who could do very well on the medications. Mm -hmm. But, and there's some people who worry about, oh, how is this going to affect our specialty? Is bariatric surgery going away? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not worried about it because it's not going to go away because there are those patients who actually would benefit more from surgery than the medications. There are also patients who just don't respond to it or mm -hmm. there's an access issue, whether it's being able to afford it or the supply or whatever. Um, there are various reasons why um, surgery could be a better option for someone. And I think the, the hard thing that we're seeing is that because it's become so widespread, it's even if it is someone going that medical management route with it, it's not always being done very well. Right. And so um, going to somebody who has proper training for that um, is something important. Do you, in your offices, do you guys provide medical management as well? Mm -hmm. Or is it surgical only? Yeah, we do. And I think that that's um, part of being a weight loss practice, you kind of have to offer that aspect of it, both the medical and the surgical side of things. Not all, not all bariatric surgeons do that though. Mm -hmm. Um, we are surgeons. We like operating. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, not every physician or surgeon will have an interest in that. Um, but it is important to be part of a practice that is interested in that kind of stuff, because it's not just about throwing out medications or throwing out surgeries mm -hmm. at someone. It's about helping patients because whether it's medications or surgery, it's at the end of the day, a tool to help yeah. patients change their lives. Right. And they, that requires a lot of coaching and a lot of guidance. And so having partnering with somebody who cares about using these tools in that aspect, that is just a tool and providing ways of coaching about lifestyle, eating habits, um, activity, exercise, sleep, stress management, all the different facets of life that affect um, how we manage our lives and mm -hmm. our bodies. Um, it's important to um, ha be partnered with someone who's interested in that kind of stuff. But yeah, so our practice offers both just because my philosophy is that we are weight loss doctors. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the things that we talk about as weight loss surgeons um, do apply to our non-surgical patients too. Like we still talk to all of our bariatric surgery patients about lifestyle, eating habits, stress management, you know, exercise. Yeah. These are all things we talk about anyway with our surgical patients. So um, it's very kind of easy to me to just talk about the same things with the pe patients who may not qualify or don't want surgery, but it applies to them too. And I think that plastic surgery and bariatric surgery, of, of all the surgical specialties, I think that we have a very similar mindset with things because we do put a lot of emphasis on mental health and nutrition. And it's really, it's applicable to all surgery, yeah. but I think that our two specialties really do put an extra focus yes. on that. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think that's why we tend to get along really well with yeah. SS specialties, <laughs> like, you know, right. as well. Yeah. So one question I have for you as well is, when people are online, they throw out these different surgeries, right? Oh, I had a jaw and switch. switch. Mm -hmm. I had, um, you know, a gastric bypass. But I don't think that everybody really understands the differences. Yeah. Are you able to kind of explain yeah. to our listeners in simple oh, yeah. terms? The I, love, the I know. So let me, this is how I simplified it. I use this <laughs> analogy with my patients because, you know, we have different surgeries for a reason. Um, and I tell them, okay, your weight loss surgery your decision on choosing your weight loss surgery or even choose weight loss surgery is kind of like choosing how you're going to get it from point A to point B. Like if there's like a hundred miles in between, okay, you can either choose to walk there or you can choose to drive there. Mm -hmm. And to me, weight loss surgery is like choosing to drive there. Um, whereas like for someone who struggles with obesity, uh, which is a metabolic syndrome disorder, choosing to do it through just lifestyle changes alone, like diet and exercise, it's doable, but it's like walking there. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of time. Um, and so, and some people may not even make it. And so 
So weight loss surgery to me is kind of like driving somewhere. So it's going to be much more efficient, much quicker to get from point A to point B. Now, the different types of surgeries are kind of like, okay, what kind of car you're getting, you're using. <laughs> so how quick it is or, you know, things like that. And so I tell my patients that right now, the main option, main, main surgical options for weight loss surgery are the sleep gastrectomy, the gastric bypass and the duodenal switch, which you already mentioned. Um, and the sleeve is sort of like a little, like a smaller car. And then the gastric bypass is the bigger car, bigger engine car. And then the duodenal switch is the biggest, fastest car. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's kind of, um, how I break it down to my patients in simple terms that they can relate to. Um, now, every surgery has different um, uh, side effects, mm -hmm. things to look out for. And so those are also important things that I go over with them. Because while, you know, say, for example, doing a switch, you, you know, it's our strongest surgery, it's our strongest car, it does come with some things you have to be aware of, right? Um, most of the, most, uh, probably all actually bariatric patients have to be on some sort of supplementation, right? right. Um, what are common th supplements that, um, if they've had the surgical route of things that mm -hmm. they do have to often supplement for yeah. their lives? We recommend that all of our bariatric surgery patients be on a bariatric multivitamin, uh, and calcium and vitamin D every day. That's pretty much it. <laughs> is, and what's the reason for that? Yeah. And so the reason is because... Mostly, especially with the malabsorptive procedures, such as the gastric bypass and the duodenal switch, um, you're not going to be, you're not going to be eating a lot, but also whatever you do eat, you're not going to absorb a lot of it. Which is why then you end up you losing have to weight. Replace, yeah, that's mm -hmm. why you end up losing weight, but then you also may end up getting uh, deficient in certain nutrients and vitamins. Um, and so the concern is you're not getting enough through food alone. Even our sleep gastrectomy patients, even though there's no malabsorption really with that surgery, it's primarily restrictive. Um, again, you're eating a lot less than you did before. And so are you getting all the vitamins and minerals that you were getting just through before, just through food alone? No, mm -hmm. because you're eating a lot less. So most patients after weight loss surgery will eat maybe a quarter cup to a half cup at a time in the first six months after surgery. And then in the long run, they'll only eat about a cup of food at a time, even, you know, years down the road after their surgery. Um, and so again, there's always that concern is, are they getting enough of their vitamins mm -hmm. and minerals? So that's why we always recommend um, that supplement regimen I, I just mentioned earlier. And it's also important for, I always very, very much emphasize that these should be bariatric multivitamins. So a lot of patients will go and get over the counter, you know, over the counter one-a-day women's or Centrum. Um, and I tell them, no, you can't take those. Those are made for people who haven't had their anatomy altered, who mm -hmm. can eat a normal amount, you know? Uh, whereas the bariatric multivitamins, if you really look at the breakdown of each vitamin level, it's a lot more than what's in your over-the-counter, you know, regular vitamins. So they really build those for the bariatric patient. What kind of follow-up do you end up having to do? Because I know, let's say someone gets their gallbladder out, yeah. right? You may see them for a little bit, mm -hmm. but then it's usually like, okay, bye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is obviously life-changing and altering forever life-changing. So um, what kind of follow-up do you personally do um, when you have patients who've undergone these surgeries? Yeah, so uh, I follow up my patients every three months for the first year, then every six months for the second year. And then I usually tell them, just think of me as like another PCP. You're going to see me every year for the rest of your life. And the whole goal of this, especially in the first two years, they're going to be losing a ton of weight. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a lot of life changes, um, not only physically, but even emotionally, mentally, you know, uh, so being able to kind of keep, keep up with them and make sure that they're coping with everything okay. Uh, and that also keep up with their um, new, like eating habits and stuff like that, make sure, making sure that they're staying on top of that too. Because uh, nutrition is very hard to understand. We don't learn about that in mm -hmm. school. We don't even learn about that in medical school. So um, being able to understand what is a healthy eating habit is can be very difficult. And so that's another reason why I follow up with them so regularly, especially in the first two years. After the first two years, usually, most people, pretty much everybody is done losing weight. It's mm -hmm. out of the weight loss period uh, and their weight has stabilized. So there's a little bit less concern about nutritional deficient deficiencies and um you know, abnormal eating behaviors or whatever um, at that point. And uh, that's why we draw out the follow-up a little bit longer. But we still want to follow up with them every year because um, weight regain can happen if mm -hmm. you don't continue following up with your doctor. And I think that's a really important point. Obviously, I see patients on the other end after they've lost weight and they've maintained mm -hmm. it. But I'm surprised by how many um, 
don't follow up anymore. Yeah. And sometimes it's really detrimental. Yes. Um, we had somebody who had no idea she had an ulcer and she hadn't been taking things properly and then she hadn't been following up with anybody. Mm -hmm. So it's important, I think, from a safety standpoint as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially when it comes to ulcers, because, you know, sometimes, you know, people forget or maybe don't never knew that you have to avoid certain medications. Mm -hmm. And so then suddenly something happens in their life and they get prescribed like an inset or uh, a steroid or whatever, and suddenly they've got an ulcer and mm -hmm. they forget or they didn't realize they weren't supposed to take that. Or maybe they needed to take certain precautions to avoid getting an ulcer when they take those medications. And that's why it's important to keep in touch with your bariatric surgeon. And NSAIDs, you know, things like ibuprofen yeah. and that class of family. And mm -hmm. I have had so many people who are post bariatric patients, uh, not obviously none of actually none of them have been local people that I know of, <laughs> um, but that are like, I didn't know I couldn't take ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, that's that could be a life threatening issue for uh -huh. you. Yeah, so definitely. It's important to listen to your doctor. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. And keep up with them. <laughs> What's um, do you if, if you can tell us a story about someone whose story, you know, changing their names and everything that really touched you like that was like a really amazing story for you. Oh, my gosh. There have been so many. And uh, but I will tell you about one who I think really touched me because um, I didn't expect it from her. Um, but she's someone who I who we did weight loss surgery on. And um, she d doesn't come from an affluent background at all. She's a lower socioeconomic status uh, patient. Uh, and those patients, we always worry about their ability to, you know, keep up with their vitamins and be able to afford the vitamins um, and uh, do well, you know, because if anything, you know, anything happens, you know, you worry about, are they going to be able to mm -hmm. handle it financially? She did great. Um, and, uh, but not only did she do great and she lost a ton of weight, she lost over a hundred pounds, but you just, her life transformed. She went from, um, I think she was working at a fast food chain somewhere, uh, just in the kitchen somewhere. Suddenly she had this drive to go to culinary school and she applied for culinary school. She got into culinary school um, and, um, and she was going through it and, you know, was starting her own business and stuff like that. Fortunately, she never followed up with me again. So I don't know, you know, what happened after that, but this is part of the transformation that I see a lot in our patients, um, that it's not just a, you know, physical transformation. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people think about these surgeries as even I'm sure you, the same thing happens in plastic surgery. Um, you know, it really transform the transforms them internally too. They suddenly have confidence <laughs> <Hence Yeah>. the, <laughs> being a confidence doc. Um, but you know, that's what we do. We help our patients build confidence and in, by building that confidence, it helps drive them in other places in life. Um, suddenly I have, um, are motivated to seek out things, uh, in career wise, you know, have goals in career, not that they didn't have goals before, but that they're more driven to and maybe they feel like them. they're more obtainable now, more that, obtainable, you know? whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. So, that's no, that's really wonderful because you're right. It is. It's it's not just about how you look. Part of how they look also affects how they feel. Exactly. And and like you said before, you're not just treating like their bodies. There's a lot of mental mm -hmm. um, um, health that has to mm -hmm. go along with it to get somebody to be able to get back onto this path. For sure. And you know, for my patients, the the excessive amount of weight, you know, like doesn't help with their mental health because there is a stigma towards obesity, unfortunately. Um, what's been one of the most challenging, and it doesn't have to be a single individual, but one of the most challenging things you find with your particular specialty? Ooh, um, I think it really is the changing of the lifestyle. Um, I think that it's not because that patients don't come in, like knowing that you have to change. Some some patients don't, mm -hmm. don't know that you have to change your lifestyle. Uh, those, that can be a challenge, but even the patients who do know it's still a struggle um, just because like I said, nutrition is not something we learn in mm -hmm. school and it's not something we really focus on uh, a lot in society on learning about. Um, and so many people don't understand. And even me as a physician, I, I struggled too early on and I spent a lot of time, you know, researching about it, reading about it um, and uh, living it myself. You know, I was overweight before too. And so I've lived it. I've lived that struggle too. Um, and kind of under, had, had, been, had to look inward on what are my struggles and what are mm -hmm. my disordered habits and, you know, what, how do I understand nutrition and why did I understand it that way? And, you know, 
And so I can relate to my patients in that sense. And so, uh, but it is something that I struggle a lot with uh, the pa- with my patients and helping them understand that because it really is the daily habits. And unfortunately, I'm not living with them. And so when they come in and, you know, if they are, if they're the ones who are, if they are struggling, you know, it's like, I go over in detail, okay, what do we, what do you, you know, what time do you wake up at? Do you have breakfast? Do you have lunch? Do you have dinner? Do you have snacks? How many snacks? What are you drinking? Um, and sometimes there's a little bit of a recall issue because the patients don't really, maybe they're not keeping track of that. Yeah. And that makes it hard for me to know, is there a problem in the eating habits or is it something else? You know, um, that's my biggest struggle with with this specialty. It can also probably be a real challenge because let's say they're on board, they're trying, but maybe their family isn't, right? Exactly. So it's the, it's not always just them, right? Right, Going exactly. Uh, whatever the forces are, you know, there are multiple forces that drive patients to do what they do, whether it's family, cultural, societal, financial, um, even marketing, you know, the subtle cues that, you know, these uh, food industry, mm-hmm. the food industry throws at us can confuse us too. Um, and it's really hard to really understand and keep track of um whether it doesn't matter how high functioning person you are Mm -hmm. Um, but again i don't live with them so it's really hard to know exactly you know how they live their lifestyle so we talk about in plastic surgery about like you know all these people going overseas and having surgeries overseas but that's actually something that also happens with bariatric Mm -hmm. quite a bit Mm -hmm. um what are common places people go uh, Tijuana is a very popular spot. <laughs> Tijuana is the surgery. Is that for the plastic everything. surgery it's a very spot too? Popular plastic surgery spot too. Yeah. Um, and what are your like you know concerns about that? Because I know that the plastic surgery side, we have a lot of concerns when people are traveling overseas. Yeah, and you know, I I I don't want I I know that there are great surgeons over there too, and I you know it's all about being able to find the one though, but. Despite that, even if you find a great one, mm-hmm. I think the main problem, at least for bariatric surgery, and I'm and I'm eager to hear what what the problems are in, pla- in the plastic surgery world, but for bariatric surgery, the problem is when you come back to the United States, who's going to take care of you? Because mm-hmm. our surgery is not the kind of surgery where it's like you follow up with them once or twice and then, okay, you're good. Bye-bye. Because mm-hmm. um, if you develop a complication, it, it can be a pretty serious, even life-threatening complication because it does involve your internal organs. Um, and so when you come back to the United States, who's going to take care of you? Um, and if it's not a ser- and if it's a very serious complication, um, you you may find someone to take care of because you go to the ER. Mm-hmm. But if it's not a serious complication and you're just struggling lifestyle wise, or you're struggling in terms of uh, weight, your weight loss, um, or eating habits, or psychiatric issues, or nutritional deficiencies, whatever it is, who's who's going to take care of mm-hmm. you? And that's the hard thing is that there are a lot of surgeons who will not take care of another surgeon's you know wor- work. We say yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have the same problems, right? Is there's no follow up. And in some cases, it can be life threatening for us as well because of not having proper aftercare, Mm -hmm. getting blood clots, Mm -hmm. getting bad infections. Mm -hmm. Um, So it, it is a situation, too, where, again, most plastic surgeons don't want to. Because they didn't start the care, they're not going to finish the care. Mm -hmm. Um, And so because otherwise now you're taking on the responsibility of something you weren't involved with. Exactly. And then they end up in the ER and may end up getting who knows how many bills um, because they tried to save money going somewhere Right. And you don't know, like, and I've seen lots of plastic surgery patients who came in through the ER, got their plastic surgery done in Mexico. And I'm the general surgeon on call. And I get called for a wound complication because there's either no plastic surgeon on call or... I don't I actually usually it's so there's no plastic surgeon mm-hmm. on call. Um, and then for bariatrics, it's like some hospitals don't have a bariatric surgeon mm-hmm. on staff even. So you go to the hospital expecting to get taken care of by you're going to get taken care of by somebody, possibly get taken care of by someone who has no experience in this particular what type of surgery. Do, yeah. yeah, It's interesting, though, because people will often like to say that this is the easy way out. Oh, you mm-hmm. had surgery. It's the easy way mm-hmm. out. And like, we're talking about all these things and nothing, nothing about it sounds mm-hmm. easy to me at no, all. No, no. And, uh, and it's funny. I see this all the time on social media too, by other bariatric patients talking about, this is not the easy way out. You know, are you having to take, you know, vitamins and stay consistent with them and still go to the gym and still, you know, watch your eating habits or whatever. But yeah, no, it's not the easy way out at all. It's a tool. It does allow you to achieve your goals. Uh, that otherwise would be very hard to achieve a, without it. Um, and that's all it is. It's not the easy way out because you, they still, those patients still have to do the same things mm-hmm. that they were doing before. I tell all my patients, you know, this is not uh, a magic pill or a magic bullet. Like mm-hmm. all those things that you've tried before, all those, you know, various different eating diets or whatever, 
and not that I'm a fan of like fad dieting or anything, but just being aware of eating habits mm-hmm. and paying attention to it uh, and learning about nutrition and staying active. These are all things that these patients still continue to do even after the surgery. And I tell them that that's how you best optimize your results and that's how you get to your goal. The patients who don't still work at these things and pair that with their surgery, they're the ones who you hear about who don't lose enough weight mm-hmm. or regain their weight, you know? Yeah. You have to kind of, if you're going to do it, you got to be all in. Mm-hmm. So obviously I see anyone I'm seeing, uh, to me, a hundred percent of people get bariatric surgery, have plastic surgery based on what I see. <laughs> but I know that's not the case. What percentage do you think of your patients seek out some form of plastic surgery? Oh man. I never really thought about that. Um, it, not as much as it should be. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it's, a, it's an access issue mm-hmm. uh, because insurance companies, you know, you know more yes. than I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they are a struggle. Um, they think that this is a cosmetic thing. Um, and it doesn't matter how much skin you got on you, you know, you don't have a major rash and you're on prescription medications, mm-hmm. right? Like they're not going to pay for it. And so and not everybody can has some of my patients can't even afford 30, a $30 medication a month, yeah. you know, like how are they going to afford, you know, excess skin removal surgery without insurance. And it's time off um, for recovery. Um, and I think what's hard too is like it, a lot of people will ask me, you know, s- send me DMs asking questions about things. And it's at the end of the day, it's not just, it depends on your state. It's not every state's going to have different requirements. And then it depends on who's your provider because mm-hmm. there's some plans that are much more bariatric friendly than others. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had people who I would would have like bet money on that. Of course, you're going to get covered. Look at like all the stuff you're having and they still won't get covered. Oh my gosh. And so it, it is, and I, I will tell you, it is from the time I started practicing to now, which has been almost 10 years, it is absolutely become much harder. It's become much harder to get coverage for procedures. Um, and, uh, you know, it don't doesn't make sense why, because if mm-hmm. anything, bariatric surgery and bariatric issues are one of the fastest mm-hmm. growing areas in medicine. Mm-hmm. So it would make sense more that this would be something that insurance would be seeing is, yes, we do need to mm-hmm. increase the coverage mm-hmm. for. Yeah, no, we... We talk about that all the time at our uh, bariatric surgical societies. It's just that this constant fight with insurance. And it's hard to know what the issue really is, except that maybe there's a little bit of stigma behind it, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, which is unfortunate that bari- uh, that for plastic surgery, it's gone the opposite route where it's getting harder and harder to get it covered because bariatric surgery is actually getting easier and easier to get covered because really? <laughs> we're working so hard at it. Yeah. But it's like it's surprising to hear that but for, from a plastic surgery standpoint, the excess irritable surgery is getting harder and harder to cover. We need to advocate more for that it's because we're going to get more and more bariatric patients who are going to end exactly. it. And, um, you know, and I would tell you that like, you know, everyone thinks that suddenly someone wants a full body makeover. It's not always. Mm-hmm. Often it's really hygiene issues mm-hmm. or, you know, I just need this because it's causing me pain or, mm-hmm. or someone who's stalled in their weight loss because they have so much excess mm-hmm. that they need that to then be able to move mm-hmm. on and keep, mm-hmm. and keep losing weight. Right. Yeah. Or they feel like they didn't get to their goal, but it's, but it's like, you probably are at your goal, but you just have all this excess Excess skin skin from the weight, weight from that. Um, So it's, it's, I think it is something that needs more advocacy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's something that's going to come up more and more. You know, you and I are familiar with peer to peers, um, (laughs) which we find this a peer to peer is when an insurance company says, sorry, we're not going to prove this, but You can have a conversation with your peer, and I'm doing this in air quotes, um, (laughs) to discuss whether or not maybe we'll cover it. Um, I've yet to ever actually talk to a plastic surgeon Mm -hmm. when I have a Mm peer-to-peer. It may be usually a surgeon, but it's a surgeon who's not in my specialty, Mm -hmm. which makes it really difficult Mm -hmm. to sometimes explain because it's out of their scope. Mm -hmm. Have you ever... Have you talked to another bariatric surgeon when you've had a peer-to-peer? It's hit or miss. Um... I feel like definitely it's always been a surgeon. I don't think I've ever talked to someone mm-hmm. not in a surgical specialty. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I've had enough peer to peer. Cause like I said, we do so much uh, advocacy and there, mm-hmm. at least the insurance companies have come around to um, covering bariatric surgery. Not all plans, like you say, like there's certain depends on the plan. And in our practice, we do, a, we were, we put a lot of work up front to screen patients cause it's, going to be a waste of not only our time but mostly the patient's time if we put them through the entire process because there is a process Mm -hmm. they have to go see a certain number of dietitians and a psychiatrist and maybe even have to do cardiac clearance or whatever only to be told at the back end oh you don't have coverage so we we put a lot of upfront work in like screening these patients but there's still the patients who 
um, who maybe have special situations where mm-hmm. um, the insurance companies are like, wait, you want to do this for what? Like reflux is a common one. Yeah. Right? Um, and uh, and so I'll do peer to peers. And sometimes it's a, with a bariatric surgeon. Sometimes it's with a, a general surgeon mm-hmm. or something. Um, they're usually it's not been that unpleasant for me but i do feel like this is a tactic that the insurance companies mm-hmm. use just to put one more thing in your way to make it that much more difficult to yes. get the patient through through the surgery and what i try to tell patients and what my team was let's say somebody calls in is we always are looking for medical records because that's what insurance wants and so uh, the best way i can put it from a plastic surgery standpoint is that your insurance is more likely to cover it if they see that it's going to cost them more to allow you to continue how you are Mm -hmm. or if it's going to save them money by saying let's do the surgery and then your takes away all these chronic issues Mm -hmm. and so the best way to do that is medical records and i can tell you as a physician who is very bad about going to doctors myself um when I have issues, it's, I understand this stuff. It's like, yeah. oh, I got to take off of work to do this. It's easier to self treat. Right. But if, you know, seriously want to get things covered, it's, you do have to go see somebody and get mm-hmm. that documented so that, that you make a stronger case for things right. to be approved. Yeah. And you know, the, again, the documentation is just another, again, one more step to make it harder because like having to call your PCP mm-hmm. and go through their phone tree and then have them fax the records, you know, like all that is just cumbersome. Sometimes the records could be a stack yeah. that's like <laughs> hundreds of pages long. And it's like, well, no, I just want the yeah. record for this. Yeah. And, but yeah. on their end, they don't want to go through all right, of it exactly. either. So. And in all those notes, it's like a one-liner thing about their rash or whatever from their ex's skin. And you're just like, where is it? In this, in this big pile, pile of stuff. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think from plus side, and I'm sure Dr. Changri from the side, we want our patients to do well. We going to yeah. take care of you. Yes. Um, and so when we ask for these things, it's not because we're trying to make more work for you. <laughs> it's just because we, we've we been around long yeah. enough to know what they need for yeah. us to try to get things approved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. So what do you feel like now? Okay, so we talked a little bit of GLP uh, medi- well, medications, and obviously that's kind of a future but current state. Where do you see the future of bariatrics going? Who? Um, I think that, you know, there... In the past, there were a lot of what we would call sleeve factories. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that those practices are going to come under a lot of pressure with these GLP-1 agonists because um, depending, again, like how, what weight you're coming in at for a sleeve, um, the lower weight patients Mm -hmm. may do okay with just a GLP-1 agonist versus the higher weight ones probably did need a sleeve Mm -hmm. or maybe even needed a bypass or whatever. Um, The sleeve has kind of exploded in the last 10 years or Mm -hmm. so um, in um, prevalence. And there are many reasons for that. I have a lot of patients who come in asking for a sleeve when Mm -hmm. they are not great candidates for a sleeve. They're either, uh, their starting weight's either too heavy, their goal is too high, uh, meaning the amount of weight loss they want to lose is too high uh, for what a sleeve can offer. Or they've got really bad reflux or whatever. You know, the, there are various reasons why someone may not be a good candidate for a sleeve. Um, but because it's blown up in popularity, some patients think that that's the best surgery out there. And it's not necessarily so. There are various reasons why the sleeve blew up in popularity. Mm-hmm. And it's because um, patients loved it. It doesn't look as scary. It looks, quote unquote, less invasive. <laughs> um, and uh, I was put that in quotes because they're kind of all the same invasiveness because they're all laparoscopic. Yeah. They died. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, surgeons love it because it's very quick. It's easy. Patients lose a lot of weight, you know, they can do five sleeves in a day when they could have only done one or two bypasses mm-hmm. or something like that, you know? Um, so there are various many like forces like that led to the sleeve becoming a very popular, um, surgery. I mean, Tijuana is a very popular sleeve factory okay. as well. <laughs> are um, bands being done by anybody no, not anymore? anymore? Again, bands were such, are also a big fad. Uh, that eventually went away because, and I understand why bands became so popular at that time, like 30, 40 years ago, it was either get the band or get the gastric bypass. Yeah. Was, <laughs> there was no in between. Yeah, yeah. Like the sleeve like wasn't really out yet or, or that prevalent yet. Mm-hmm. And, so, and then at that time we were still kind of getting, building our experience with the gastric mm-hmm. bypass. So the morbidity mortality was much higher back then than it was today, which is what led to the poor reputation of the gastric bypass today and why so many people are, against the gastric bypass, even though we've gotten so much better at things like the gastric bypass, bariatric surgery in general, we've just gotten so much better at it. We're doing them like on an outpatient basis even now. Yeah. Um, 
Um, but anyway, so the sleeve kind of has exploded in popularity, and I think the the practices who only do sleeves will come under will come under a lot of pressure because mm-hmm. uh, they only have one tool in their belt. Um, and when that tool can be almost like as effective, or, or when there's a when there's when there's a medication that can mm-hmm. be almost as effective as your one tool, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you're going to lose a lot of patients um, in that sense. So I think bariatrics will change in the sense that there will be um, more people who will have to be experienced with the malabsorptive procedures, such mm-hmm. as the gastric bypass and duodenal switch, um, just because some of those patients who they were getting uh, coming, who were coming in to get the sleeves, uh, a lot of those patients may go, go away. away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and we may, we may also see, um, and 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 we're going to and bariatric patients are probably going to become bigger. Like we're, I'm seeing a lot more um, BMI 50, 60, 70 patients, wow. which yeah. probably translates to about 400, 500 pound patients. Um, I'm seeing a lot more of those patients through my offices now. I'm seeing a lot less of the lower BMI um, patients um, in my, coming through my office. And I'm curious because I actually have zero idea about this, but um, what about bar- overweight or obese pediatric patients mm-hmm. like what are the options for those patients yeah the pediatric bariatric surgery is a very controversial field right now um there are um uh, facilities or practices that mm-hmm. specialize in these things um and the controversy is just you know are they old enough to uh understand uh what it takes to be successful for the long term and, yeah with yeah. weight loss surgery they have their entire lives ahead I had the same concerns for my patients who were like 21, you know, uh, and it's like they have their entire lives ahead of them. Um, anything could happen in that lifespan, you know, uh, bad breakup, um, some sort of traumatic event, uh, death in the family, pregnancy, yeah. uh, raising kids, the stress of raising kids, you know, whatever, all these different life things that mm-hmm. could happen to you to cause you to fall off the rails when it comes to your weight loss journey. Yeah. Um, and so, what are their, you know, if they've already had surgery, what are their options then? Uh, gotcha. And so that's that's the question long-term wise. Uh, in the immediate post-op period, it's just about, are they emotionally mature enough, psychologically mature enough to understand the responsibility of, you know, taking care of yourself and paying attention to what you're eating, uh, working out or staying active on working out on a regular basis, you know, all these different things to take care of your body. I mean, like I remember when I was like, in my twenties and in college, you know, like we were, all I cared about was like <laughs> getting through school, getting to class. And, you know, I probably, I ate crap. And, and your body <laughs> ate pizza, yeah, like, pizza, Wendy's pizza. ramen, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was not emotionally mature back then, you know? So, you know, these are, I think, legitimate concerns when it comes to the pediatric patient, but there are some patients who, you know, are very mature mm-hmm. and, you know, have it together and totally understand what it takes. And so you just kind of have to treat each patient as an individual. Well, hopefully too, the trend is that we stop thinking about obesity as being somebody's weakness Mm -hmm. and think about it as the signs of having health issues, Mm -hmm. right? The mental and physical. Mm -hmm. And that if we approach it from that way, then we can treat it like we treat anything else. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I often tell patients, the insurance companies, you know, I know we were dogging a lot on them this episode. But That's okay, they can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, because it's like you know, they want to they they want to criticize the bariatric patients for you know getting like, you got this you got this way because of your issues, you know, your behavioral issues or whatever. Yeah. Um. But are they going to deny uh, a smoker from getting a cardiac mm-hmm. bypass because they're still smoking? Uh, or because they smoked before, yeah, and that's what led to them getting atherosclerotic d- disease. And no, they're going to pay for it anyway. Yeah. So there are a lot of all of our health problems are, you know, some are somehow related to some lifestyle choices we make, right? right? Um, but they are at the end of the day medical issues that come up, and we got to take care of the patient. And so obesity is very much that it's a medical problem. It's a problem with the metabolism. Um, how we got there doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters is, is that you know, those changes do need to happen later on, just like how someone Mm -hmm. who develops, gets a heart attack, needs to stop smoking afterwards. Right. Um, But we shouldn't punish them and prevent them from getting the care they need just because of past decisions that maybe they were out of their control. Yeah, that's beautifully said. I mean, we don't need to point fingers. Um, Let's take care of the person first and then work on the issues sometimes that got there. Yeah, exactly. We don't treat any other patient like that. (laughs) 
Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was really informative. I learned some stuff that I didn't know. Yeah, and me too. I think that was a really great overview kind of of like, you know, what goes into someone approaching weight loss, um, whether it's medical or surgical. And uh, Dr. Victoria Chang practices here in Houston. And what's the name of your practice? So I'm a part of TurnQuest Surgical Solutions. It's me, Dr. TurnQuest. Uh, we are a practice that specializes in weight loss surgery. And did you want to share uh, your handle so people oh, can yeah. follow you because she does great educational content? Yes. So uh, I'm active on Instagram and Facebook and my handle is um, at Dr. Victoria Chang. So thank you so much for joining us. This was great. Thanks for having me. This is fun. <laughs> and thank you so much for listening, everybody. This was the Confidence Stock Podcast and we will see you next time. As we wrap up another episode of The Confidence Stock, I want to extend our heartfelt thank you for being a part of our community. If today's conversation resonated with you, remember that Dr. Rettenham and her team are here to support you on your journey to self-confidence and beauty. Your story is unique and it's our privilege to help you create the masterpiece that is your life. If you'd like to book a consultation with Dr. Rettenham, you can visit her webpage at drrukminiretinum.com. Fill out a contact form and one of her coordinators will get with you accordingly.